Um, I um, feel a little embarrassed in a sense because um, what, I, what I will have to say today is not just about uh, economics, uh, but it'll touch on a lot of different things. So economics, politics, uh, sociology, psychology, uh, so a very sort of multidisciplinary approach to things. But I don't think that's a bad idea because frankly I think economics has been stuck in the rut of single discipline uh, for far too long a period of time. And um, I um, will really be speaking to that as sort of a, a, a basic theme. Um, I guess the single most important point that I want to get across about macroeconomics and uh, I say this after uh, almost 40 years trying to study this subject, is that in both this area and in most areas, we know a lot less than we think we know. And uh, if you think about it, you can go back to the ancient Greeks. Remember the story of Icarus who flew too, flew too close to the sun and the wings melted and that was the end of it. You know, hubris. It's the Greeks. 3,000 years ago, pointed that out to us as a fundamental flaw in the human character. And, um, and I think it continues, because human nature doesn't change all that quickly, right? So um, a more recent quotation, uh, some of you may remember this, some perhaps not, Don Rumsfeld, who used to be the American uh, Secretary of Defense. And uh, Rumsfeld uh, was roundly abused by everybody for saying what I thought was something very sensible. And he said, there's things we know we know. There's things we know we don't know. But there are things that we don't know we don't know. Right? There are things you don't know that get you. And Mark Twain, some of you may, may remember him, the American writer and author. Uh, Mark Twain said once about 100 years ago, um, it ain't the things that you don't know what gets you. It's the things what you know for sure, what ain't so. So it's the mistaken false beliefs that really suck you into the biggest mistakes. And that's uh, really, I guess, what, um, what I'll, I'll be talking about mostly uh, today. Well, this paper uh, has been circulated to you. And uh, Mark told me last night, it's always good when the speaker speaks to the paper that he circulated, makes it easier for the people that have prepared their comments. Um, so I'm going to be quite religious, well, pretty religiously, uh, speaking to this text and in the order of the text. So you, there'll be no surprises. Um, <clears throat> I guess my first point by way of introduction is that the, uh, the global economy um, is not in good shape. Um, and I think um, monetary policies have been um, in large part to blame. I put partly here. That's in honor of Jean-Claude, who'll be coming this afternoon, uh, whom I've known for 30 years, I suppose, uh, in the central banking community and before. But I think the problems that the global economy faces, and I'll come to those in a bit more detail in a moment or two on a later slide, I think that monetary policies are, are largely uh, to blame. And why is that so? I think that central banks have made a, a profound, what I call ontological error. And this has to do with the assumptions that people make about the nature of the economy. Okay, and when you think about sort of philosophy, um, the ontology, epistemology, the study of the nature of things and what can you know about things given their nature. There are fundamental limitations to your knowledge. I think we made a, a wrong choice there and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, the previous policy objective um, a monetary policy was domestic price stability. And you, you hear this over and over again. You know, this is, this is a, a, desirable, um, a desirable thing to have, price stability. Um, but 
the common belief prior to the end of the great moderation, you know, when sort of we had many, many years of good economic performance and then the whole thing collapsed, the, the predominant view before that was that if you had price stability, and we did generally have price stability, that everything would be fine. And then, of course, the whole thing collapsed in 2007, uh, which should have put paid to that idea that price stability was sufficient for good macroeconomic performance. It didn't. I'll come to that in a second. Um, since the, great, the end of the Great Moderation, what's sort of interesting is that um, the G20 has now recognized that the previous objective was inadequate. And if you go back to the sort of the press, um, what do you call them, the press releases, uh, back to 2008, 2009 of the G20, what you see is that there's been a fantastic shift in terms of the objective of policy. Now, it's not been totally incorporated into what people do, but at least at the topmost levels, the leaders of the G20 are saying, we don't want just strong growth, or at least as strong as you can get consistent with price stability. We want strong, sustainable, and inclusive growth, right? which is a much more, um, which is a much more uh, difficult, difficult problem. Um, what's sort of funny about it is that we think about this new stuff, this post-crisis stuff, as being, as being new. But the odd thing is that it isn't. In a certain way, the aberration was the last 40 or 50 years. Most of the, people, most of the years I've been doing central banking. <coughs> the real, what's happening here is there's a, a return to the recognition of the insights of the classical economists. Guys like David Ricardo, well, above all, Adam Smith, David Hume, Ricardo, Karl Marx, all of those people. Because they were worried about all three of the things that the G20 are worried about. They were worried about strong growth and where it comes from. What are the origins of growth? They were worried about crises. Where do the crises come from? What can we do about them? And above all, they were interested in distributional issues. And Marx, of course, at the at the end of that particular spectrum, talking about class war. But it, it reflected the underlying concern of all the others. Distributional issues are important. And frankly, distributional issues almost disappeared from macroeconomics for 50 years, you know, in the whole post-war period. Uh, the basic idea, and I'll come back to this later on, the basic idea was that, um, um, if everybody earns their marginal product, then there's nothing to say about distributional issues. And if there's nothing to say about distributional issues, then there's nothing to say about power. And there's nothing to say about politics. And so you keep all of that messy stuff away from the people who would like you not to think about these kinds of things. So I think we're going back to some of that stuff. And I think that's really a good idea. OK, what's, what's, the, what's the nature of the problem? Um, how, how do we know that things are screwed up? All right. Well, uh, first answer, of course, is the end of the Great Moderation in 2008. Huge recession in 2009. And then subsequent waves of recession. So we had the big recession of 2009, which was basically global. And then we had um, the European crisis. Started in Greek and then Greece and then spread out to all the peripheral countries. And then in a third wave, we had the emerging markets. And so they were doing pretty well for a while, but then everything collapsed in Russia, China, Brazil. Okay, they're coming back now. Everybody seems to be coming back. But uh, three big waves of, uh, of downturns. Um, the other thing that's been noticeable about this whole thing is these consistent overestimates of growth and inflation. So if you go back to the IMF estimates of uh, 2009, let's say, well, even before, but since the recession began, 
you look at the official forecast of the IMF and the OECD, and the official forecasts are always that everything's going to get better. Okay? So growth is going to get, growth is weak, it's going to get stronger. Inflation is too low, it's going to get higher. Right? And the driving force behind it, I think, and I'll go to this analytical stuff later on, is that all of the models in the analytical framework say we're going back to normal. Okay? We're going back to equilibrium. And we've had nine years in a row, right? this last year being an exception, we had nine years in a row of these forecasts that were consistently wrong, both on the real growth side and on the inflation side. So something, something's, something's up here. Um, the, 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 second, the second point is that um, every major geographical area has got problems. So at the moment you read the newspapers and they're all talking about, well, it looks as if the recovery eight years late has finally begun. But when you look at every area of the world, you can see that there are some real problems still lurking out there. So, for example, in the United States, uh, productivity growth rates are still very low. Participation rates have been falling, uh, particularly for adult men. Uh, the number of opioid deaths in the United States last year was 68,000. That's as many as people died in car crashes or were killed by guns. Okay? So the U.S. has got a lot of deep problems. Uh, China has got a huge problem in the sense that they've got to move from an economy which is based just on investment for growth, investment and exports, and they're going to move towards consumption-led growth. But any kind of a movement of that nature is going to be filled with difficulties. Uh, Japan, I think we can get into this in question time. I think abenomics is totally misguided, uh, and it has not worked, and it will not work. Um, I think in Europe, I don't need to tell people, we're probably mostly from Europe, uh, but the problems are here, uh, not least the banking system, where the NPL problem is still being, there's a trillion dollars worth of basically unrecognized non-performing loans. Uh, and the EMEs, I think, too, have also got their problems. Commodity prices are low. So everywhere you look, the point of the matter is you, you can't say everything looks great because it doesn't, and that's just the reality. Um, the other thing that sort of worries me about the, the problem is that it's not just economic, so that everywhere you look, you see that there are political problems as well, and you need political stability in order to do the hard things that are required when you've got economic problems. Right? And so you look at the United States, uh, even before Donald Trump, an incredible polarization between the Democrats and the Republicans. They can't decide on anything. Politics is supposed to be the art of the possible. It's not happening in the United States. Uh, in Europe, we have the problem of making changes and needing 27 countries to come on side. Uh, in China, the growth model has produced more billionaires. There are now more billionaires in China than there are in the United States. Okay? So it took the states 300 years to do what they did. The Chinese have done it in 30 or 40 years. All sorts of people who've got rich with the old model are going to be very loath to give it up in place of the new model. And all of this is going to get fought out in the confines of the Communist Party. Okay? Because everybody who is anybody is a member of the party. So they've got big political problems there as well. So that's all sort of very worrisome. And the last thing on the political side is the associated rise of populism. So there's hard, as I'll come to, the hard things need to be done, need the political will to do it, but the mood of the man in the street is moving in the very opposite direction. And you think about Brexit, and you think about Madame Le Pen, and you think about uh, Auf für Deutschland, and you think about any, anywhere you want to look, basically, uh, this rise of populism. And what makes the rise of populism more dangerous, in a way, is that this is not something that is uh, 
unusual. There's now quite a data bank okay, of work that's been done by scholars looking back at the history of previous financial crises. Uh, particularly, uh, there's a thing done by a guy called, it's in my, it's in my paper, uh, by um, Schulerich, Fuente, and somebody else. It's in the paper. Uh, they've got a database that goes back 100 years, over 40 countries. And these financial crises, there are these big economic crises, always wind up with the same political reaction which is you get a polarization, item number one, we all know who we hate, right? We get a polarization, and think about most of the votes were not for something, they were against something. Right? So we all know who we hate, and the polarization is sort of odd, because the polarization tends to be between not the right and the left, but between the left and the nationalists. Right? So if you want to put it the left, the socialists, the one that think we need more government control. And the, and the other spectrum is the nationalists. But if you put the two of them together, what you get is the national socialists. And this is the way traditionally these things tend to go. So we're not dealing with something that is ephemeral here. This is a deep-seated response to, of human nature to these current problems. So do we have a problem? The answer is yes, we do. Well, what are the origins of the problem? Um, I want to suggest this whole thing is based on a bad philosophical premise, that the economy is actually understandable and controllable. And it isn't. And that's the, you know, it's like the sun goes around the earth, right? No, it doesn't. The Earth goes around the Sun. Fundamental starting point, Ptolemy, Copernicus, changes everything. Right? So we've, we've, we've made the wrong choice a long time ago with this controllable and understandable. And when you look at the modeling assumptions, and I'm sure you guys have all been, I use guys in a generic sense, okay? I'm sorry, guys and women. Um, folk, as I should say, folk, you folk. Um, you look at the, the, the assumptions that are behind the models that are currently being used, both in the universities and in all the, the central banks, more or less, okay, in the limit sort of DSG type modeling and the sort of assumptions that you need. First one I've already alluded to, which is that um, the first assumption they all make is that we go back to full employment at whatever inflation level the central bank sets. Okay, that's the first, first assumption. It may not be true, as I've just indicated. We've had nine years indicating that it isn't true. Um, second thing in these models is that um, financial markets are almost totally ignored okay? because they're hard to model. And I remember when I started work at the Bank of Canada back in the 1970s, and uh, we had uh, a model of the financial sector. And we could never make the damn thing work. And in the end, we just had to give it up. And you'll find in most of these models that all that's left of the financial sector is the central bank sets a policy rate, and maybe there's a term structure equation, okay? The financial sector is almost entirely absent. And what that means is credit, money, and debt are also absent from these models. The other thing that these models have to ignore is that um, they ignore cumulative processes. Okay? Stocks. You think about the national income accounts, okay? We're all predicting GDP, okay? It's a flow. Okay? And virtually all of these models have got a primary focus on the flows and the cumulative stuff is just basically ignored. Now, starting to get back into it. I mean, I'm not denying the fact that progress is being made, but basically in these, tri these, these models, all these stock things were ignored. Um, what's the character of the people in these models? Okay, people like you and, you and me, character of the people. Well, there's only one people. is the representative agent. And he knows everything, he or she knows everything. And they've got all the probability distributions in their minds about what's going to happen. They're basically omniscient, eh? a representative agent who knows everything. And that's at the guts of, of all of this stuff. And um, I guess what I want to suggest is 
Well, why are there reasons for concern about the usefulness of these models? Well, in a sense, I've already implied the, 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 the first reason for concern. Uh, the underlying assumptions are totally unreasonable. Okay? This is not the way people act. And the idea that you can represent millions by one representative agent is just totally unreasonable. Uh, the second thing that I think is a source of concern about these models is that they're totally non-scientific. Now, what do I mean about scientific? Um, science is based on some combination of inductive and deductive reasoning. Right? I've got a theory. I've got a theory about how the world works. Well, now the next point is, confront your theory with the facts, and let's see whether the facts support your theory. Well, most of these models are not done that way. Virtually all of them are not done that way. Uh, they're calibrated to give the results that the modelers want them to have. And so in that sense, they're fundamentally non-scientific. And um, I made allusion to, um, what's the word? The basis of science is inductive and deductive. And Willem Boiter, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Willem, an enormously smart guy who now works at Citibank. And, and Willem says, no, no, there are actually three ways to prove things. There's induction, deduction, and repetition. So if you say over and over again, my way of doing it is the only way to do it, eventually people start saying it must be true. But it isn't true. So, these models, I think, are fundamentally non-scientific. Um, so, if you're going to say, I don't want to go with the old stuff, then the question is, what's the new stuff? And I go back again to my fundamental ontological point, that if the economy is not understandable and controllable, maybe we should start modeling it as something that is complex and adaptive. And when you think about it, it's just simply saying that the economy is a system like virtually every other system you can think of, both in nature and society. And there's been huge amounts of um, work done on an increasing number of books written about complex adaptive systems. And they're all totally applicable to, to economics. Now, why do I say that? In a, in a way, these complex adaptive systems are totally at the other end of the spe spectrum from DSGE. So what you start off with is the recognition that there's a zillion different actors, okay? All the different consumers, all the different <coughs> investors, the companies, the institutions, da da And they all operate according to fairly simple rules because they're actually pretty stupid, which was the, I guess, which was the point I make in the first, first line of my presentation. You know, compared to what there is to know, what we know makes us all pretty stupid. And these, rep, these, these agents all work according to simple rules. But if the rules don't work, and this is very consistent with the whole process of evolution, if the rules don't work, then they change the behavior. And either the new rules work and they survive, or they don't work, and they perish. And that's evolution. And that's the way the economy works as well. It's a kind of evolutionary process. Uh, these systems, uh, and I'll come to their characteristics later on, have got a lot of properties across all of these disciplines. Okay? Um, item one is that, um, and I will come back to this, is that in these kinds of complex systems, nonlinearities are very, very common. The biggest linearity is that the whole system breaks down. Okay? Think about the dinosaurs, you know, that kind of thing, where the system got so complicated that presumably one little thing went wrong in sort of like a Persian tapestry. You, know, you pull one thread and the whole thing just falls apart. So these nonlinearities non are very common. They follow a power law. Uh, across these disciplines, which is to say you get big discontinuities infrequently and you get small discontinuities quite frequently. But what you don't get is the kind of linear, linearized processes that you see in the standard models. That's not the way the world works. So um, these, I was going to tell you, you know that joke? I mean, the joke says it all. Guy falls from the 20th story window. <laughs> 
And he passes the second story and someone shouts out, how are you doing? The guy says, so far, so good. That's a nonlinear process. Um, the other thing about uh, these models, these, these uh, com complex adaptive models, is that they produce what are known as emergent properties. That is to say that the characteristics of the system as a whole are fundamentally based not on the nature of the constituents, but on the nature of the interaction between the constituents. So when you see a flock of birds or a school of fish, it is recognizably a flock or a school. And you don't really need to know, although it would be nice, what the underlying rules are of the individual fish or bird, which is probably no more complicated than say, stay close to John, but not too close. You know, to sort of stay close to the center so you don't get eaten. Um, but the point of the matter is that these systems do generate, what's the word, characteristics at a, at a higher level that you can study uniquely at a higher level. So I'll give you an example is the weather. Okay? If you really wanted to understand the weather, you'd have to know the nature of and the interactions between all of the individual molecules that are interacting to produce the weather. But what we know is that the interaction of those molecules produces an emergent system in which temperature and pressure, which can be measured, have effects that can be predicted. So it's at a different level from the underlying molecular structure, and the economy is much the same. We can actually say something about the economy, but we have to think about what it is that's driven that emergent system. So, and I frankly think, remember the, you get all this micro, macro, Bob Lucas, macro has got to have micro foundations. Think about what they did. What they did was they said macro is micro. So we've got a representative agent who maximizes. Macro has become micro. Whereas this other stuff, where you have emergent properties arising from, that's the real link between micro and macro. Okay? Much more satisfactory than this, this fiction of a representative agent. Um, a lesson in humility for everyone. The central point is that if these systems are not really understandable to any sort of great degree, we should be much more humble about most stuff in economics. And I think leading up to the crisis, uh, although my presentation can be mostly about the bad role played by central bankers, the fact of the matter is that everybody suffered from the same degree of hubris and in a way contributed equally to the crisis. So when I think about the regulators, uh, and I was in charge of the Secretariat for the Basel Supervisors for many years, their fundamental belief was that if each individual institution was um, healthy, then the system was healthy, and that was wrong. Individual people who bought houses, I'm thinking particularly in the United States, but in many, many other countries as well, on the belief that house prices couldn't go down, we know that, well, they were wrong. Uh, politicians who basically, in the lead up to the, the end of the great moderation, huge amounts of money going into treasuries, okay, fiscal drag. And the politicians all said, this is structural and permanent, we can spend it. And they were wrong. And guys like Gordon Brown and, are still, in a certain way, sort of apologizing. That was a big mistake. And the central bankers, above all, I think, made a, a big mistake because they had as their objective price stability, and they had price stability, and they said everything's got to be fine because we've got price stability, and they were wrong. And that's mostly what I'll be talking about. Um, let me go through the rest of this a bit more, more quickly. Uh, take you through monetary policy in the pre-crisis period and then in the post-crisis period. And then I'll go on to talk about uh, some of the lessons that we've learned or we should have learned from all of this stuff. Um, monetary policy in the pre-crisis period. Um, I wrote a, quite a long article in a book that was um, 
sponsored by SWEF, you know, the university network here in Europe. And my paper was called uh, Monetary Policy Over the Last 50 Years, Theory and Practice. And one of the things that comes out of it is that there have been enormous changes in the way in which monetary policy has been conducted over the course of the last 50 years. So anybody who tells you there's only one right way to do it um, should have the humility to go back and look at history where they've said that so many times and then have been forced to change their mind. So here, I mean, fine-tuning Nairo and the Volcker, uh, the Volcker um, shock. Uh, in the post-war period, um, the, the, the idea about fine-tuning became sort of more and more generally entrenched, that you could use both monetary policy and um, fiscal policy to keep the, the economy, you know, humming along at full employment. And uh, in those days, they didn't worry so much about price inflation. This is sort of prior to the 1970s. They didn't worry so much about inflation. Indeed, there was a general belief, you know, the, the Phillips curve, that there was a long-run Phillips curve and that you could get lower unemployment. Uh, you'd have to accept a little bit more inflation, but that's not a problem, right? It's, you know, one or two percent, it's only a little inflation. It's like it's only a little bit of uh, fentanyl. Um, and so people bought into it. And then during the 1970s, the whole thing exploded. And that was really, um, when Ed Phelps and Milton Friedman came along, and you had this idea of um, the Nehru, you know, the concept that if inflation went up and it drove up inflationary expectations, okay, that whole thing could set off a kind of vicious circle for which there would be no end, but hyperinflation. Right? Constantly, the Phillips curve constantly ratcheting, ratcheting up. Um, and so, some combination of the inflation of the 1970s and these insights from Ed Phelps and Friedman, for which I think they both won the Nobel Prize, uh, led, to the, led to Paul Volcker, who was then the head of the Fed, uh, around 1981 or 82, basically saying this has to stop. And, uh, and he did stop it. And interest rates in the US and Canada, lesser so in Europe, but interest rates in the US went up, I think, to 22%. And that just basically broke the back of the whole thing, uh, called the Volcker shock. And inflation in the early 1980s, having gone up to about 12%, 13% more, then gradually, well, not so gradually, went down pretty quickly afterwards through the 1980s. But then a funny thing happened. So we're all sort of thinking about this disinflationary shock. But a funny thing happened, and that was that um, after that, it was almost all to my mind, excessively expansionary monetary policies. And it all started in 1987 when the stock market, there was a big crash in the stock market. And people everywhere eased monetary policy. And then we had another sort of shock in 91 and the reaction was eased monetary policy. In 97 with the, 96 with the Asian, no, 97 with the Asian crisis, 98 with the LTCM crisis, 1991 with the, what they call the TMT crisis, the stock market collapse, technical side in 1991. The reaction in every case was you lower interest rates. But the problem was, and the word asymmetric is very important here, the, the, the problem was that both monetary policies and fiscal policy were eased a lot in the downturns, but they were never r tightened as much in the upturns. And so if you look at it over this 20 or 30 year period, you get this gradual sort of asymmetric ratcheting down of interest rates and the ratcheting up of debt levels, particularly government debt levels. So underlying it all, this stock thing that I talked about was gaining more and more importance. And so that really went on for ages and ages. And the, the, the question is, why did that happen? And uh, one big reason was and again, we go back to the models. The central banks never gave as much importance to the supply side shocks as they should have done. The models are basically demand side, new Keynesian in the sense of the focus on the demand side. 
And what was going on and received totally inadequate attention was China and Slovakia. And all of these countries that came back into the world trading system, really starting in the 19, 19, late 1970s, I guess, in China, and then the fall of the wall and all that stuff. And there were literally billions of new workers. And this put an enormous disinflationary pressure in the entire world, in my judgment. And the upshot of it was that whenever the central banks and the advanced market economies wanted to lower interest rates, there was no impediment to doing it because inflation was low. And whenever the economy was strong, there was no great need to raise interest rates because inflation was low. And so we went on for 20 years or so with the central bankers talking this big game about we're going to reduce inflation. But actually what they were doing was the very opposite that the Chinese and the Slovakians were, and technical change, you can come back to that later on, it's also a very important actor here. Th that was the underlying disinflationary force and the central banks for the most part were acting in the wrong direction. But they never basically talked about it. You can raise this for Jean-Claude this afternoon, I'm sure he'll be uh, amused. Um, so what was the upshot of all of this sort of monetary easing? As I put it here in the last, we had these, decades, really, of excessively easy monetary policy, which I call in the paper, I think, unnaturally easy monetary policy. And um, the upshot was that it gave rise to all sorts of imbalances in the economy, the kind of imbalances that Hayek would have recognized or Minsky would have recognized, but the new Keynesian models don't recognize. Uh, I define imbalances as um, significant and sustained deviations from norms, okay? Now, sometimes in complex adaptive systems, it's obvious in a sense that what has happened and it's essentially benign, okay? It's, uh, some of these things can be explained and then you don't worry about them. But a lot of the things are very hard to explain. And what I think they ought to do uh, is they ought to be precursors of, I'll come back to this at the end, of concern about the system is becoming incoherent and unbalanced and systemically unstable. Uh, and we saw all sorts of examples of that prior to 2008 in the advanced market economies. Um, all the English-speaking countries, for example, the savings rate, household savings rate, bas basically went to zero or less. I mean, in New Zealand, I think they went to minus eight at a maximum or a minimum, okay? There was so much speculation in house prices and, you know. So the savings rate went down to nothing. Uh, the credit, uh, credit expansion was very, very large. Uh, credit standards dipped very, very sharply. So if you looked into the financial markets in the lead up to the crisis of 2008, well, best example would be subprime. You know, millions of people got mortgages who never should have got mortgages. They should have been renting, uh, bit off more than they could chew. Cov they call Covlite corporate loans. You know, where normally when a bank makes a loan to a corporate, the 30 pages of documentation to say, you shall not, you shall not. If this happens, that happens. You know, like if your interest charges get too large, then you have to give us more collateral. Those covenants just shrank and shrank and shrank. Uh, interest rate spreads went way down, construction went way up, <coughs> huge imbalances that the central bankers totally ignored. And I was in the room for all of it. And we wrote all sorts of articles and gave all sorts of presentations and it totally... Um, and of course it wasn't just in the AME, it wasn't, the AMEs is the advanced market economies, it also spread <coughs> to the emerging market economies. And the way that it did was, of course, if you think about easy money in the advanced market economies, easy money ought to make your exchange rate go down. Okay. Well, the reaction of the emerging market countries, most of whom actually were leading the big ones, had implicitly a kind of mercantilist export-led development growth program. Their reaction was one of, if you can print the money without limit, to get your currencies down, we can print the money without limit to prevent our currencies from going up. 
And that's precisely what they did. And so in the end, we had a global problem. I'll come back to this. Not as big as we've got today, but we had a global problem. And it was an accident waiting to happen, and nobody, nobody saw it coming. So the central bankers, going, going back to the hubris from before, everybody was so content with their view of the world, everything will be fine if, and the beliefs were wrong, that when the warnings came, uh, people just totally ignored them. But they were into human nature here, eh? So this is the thing you've got to keep in mind, that you, you, human nature is very important in explaining the way the economy works, because it's the human beings that are core, not a represent, rep, representative agent. It's people that behave like people. So, um, monetary policy in the post-crisis period. Well, um, when the crisis hit in 2009, the, the governments pulled out all the stops. Okay, so every policy you can think of moved in an expansionary direction. I mean, it was totally Keynesian, and in a way it was totally right, particularly what the central banks did. Because the financial markets in 2009 totally seized up, and the central bankers recognized that they needed to act as lenders of last resort, and they absolutely did what needed to be done. Uh, they were in there, vast piles of cash, lender of last resort, extended the safety net. They did all the stuff that needed to be done. But everybody else was doing the same stuff. So you had a massive increase in the fiscal deficits in virtually all the major countries. Um, special programs, for example, cash, cash for clunkers. You know, you got rebates on buying new cars. Um, um, short time working in many countries, particularly countries that were dependent on manufacturing exports to keep their industries going. And I'm thinking about Germany, Japan, uh, Holland. Uh, many of these countries okay, went on to short time working because manufacturing was so important for them. Um, unfortunately, um, all of these policies that they did, because in the real world, you have to take account of the next period as well as this period. It's not a one-period static world. It's a multi-period dynamic world. All of these policies had good effects up front, but bad effects over time. And so with the fiscal, for example, people very quickly realized, against the backdrop of the European crisis, if your, de if your debt gets too big, your sovereign debt gets too big, you can be in really big trouble. And so, very quickly, there was a reaction. Everybody moved in the direction of fiscal austerity. Um, regulatory stuff, where during the, the early days of the crisis, regulatory forbearance, we have a real problem here. Where, you know, the, the normal rules don't apply. It was all regulatory forbearance. And then they started to realize the moral hazard that goes with that. So regulatory went in the opposite direction. And all the other programs all went in the opposite direction because they all had bad side effects. But the one funny thing about it is that the bad side effects of easy money were never accepted nor recognized. And the upshot was that monetary policy was left as the only game in town. Everything else was moving towards restraint. So monetary policy had no choice but to continue to be expansionary. And um, I would say, of course, it's been increasingly inventive. You know, if you think about uh, all the stuff that's been done, you know, forward, uh, uh, what is it, um, what's the phrase I'm after? Warnings about what they're going to do. Forward guidance, uh, quantitative easing, the list goes on and on. Incredibly inventive. But essentially more of the same. More of the same stuff that they did prior to the crisis that caused the crisis in the first place. They've just done more of the same. And it's premised on two things, uh, first of which was that it would work to increase aggregate demand. And the second, and that's the next slide, is that it would, um, would not have any side effects that were, that were worth worrying about. And my contention will be that both of those assumptions are wrong. Now, the business about lifting aggregate demand um, all I can say is that policy got started in 2008, 
It's now 2018. I guess we're getting close to full capacity, but a cycle that's taken eight years to come to fruition is not exactly normal. Um, and then the question is, why not? And my own view is that um, we should never have expected monetary policy to have uh, a strong effect on aggregate demand in the first place over an extended period of time. And the reason for it in, a f in the first place is what they've done smells of panic. Okay? When you have to do all of this stuff that's really, really inventive, what happens is people are not encouraged to spend more. They say, I'm, I'm out of here. Okay? And that's exactly what uh, I think has happened. Second thing is when you think about how monetary policy works, it, um, it moves spending from the future into the present. But pretty soon, tomorrow becomes today. Okay? And my American colleagues never wanted to talk about this. They always wanted to talk about intertemporal optimization of consumption. Okay? So you bring the consumption forward, and that's good. But what they never wanted to talk about was the debt buildup that was the association of that moving the spending forward. And that was bad. Okay? And over time, it would come back to haunt you. So you can't prima facie expect monetary policy to work over extended periods. And there's all sorts of other points that I could bring up, but they're all in the paper, so you, so you want to take a look at that. Keynes, actually, back in 1936 in the general theory, there's a great quote where Keynes said, and this is the intellectual journey from the treatise to the general theory. Uh, Keynes said, if we are tempted to assert that money is the liquid, that motivates the system to activity, we would best remember there are many slips twixt the cup and the lip. And then it goes on about why the transmission mechanism won't work. So it was all there and it was all ignored. So um, what about um, the unintended consequences? Um, first of all, in the advanced market economies, the unintended consequences. This thing is creating financial instability, not financial stability. And it's doing so in a variety of ways, one of which is that the margins, pension funds, insurance companies, banks, all the margins have been squeezed. And how can you recapitalize yourself in an environment like that? Didn't get thought about. Uh, people being induced to do more and more risky things, and we see this all over the place. Uh, none of this is conducive to financial stability. Second thing is that um, it lowers potential growth. So the way I like to think about it in a kind of Vexalian context is that if you keep the financial rate of interest low, en low enough, long enough, the natural rate of interest is sure to follow. And I can give you all sorts of arguments about uh, why potential is likely to be lower going forward, uh, not least of which is banks. I referred earlier on to non-performing loans in Europe. Uh, banks have got lots of zombie companies on the books. Eh? They're afraid to pull the plug because the banks don't know whether they can survive the loss of capital. Eh? So they keep the zombie companies on the books, and the zombie companies keep competing with the new guys and preventing the new guys from getting a, getting a hold on markets. And the banks themselves are preoccupied with the old zombies, and they're not giving the money to the guys in, you know, the Bill Gates, the guys in garages, the people who have no collateral. Eh? But that's the lifeblood of an innovative, creative system, and they're not getting the money. So it lowers potential, and that, that bothers me. Uh, Deleveraging. In the advanced market economies, you know, we normally think of a crisis as a, a period of time in which you deliver, you become more sober, you become more sane. Hasn't happened. You know, household debt in the States is down a bit, stabilized maybe in Europe. Corporate debt is still a disaster in most places. Uh, and what's worst of all, I guess, is spreading to the EMEs, the emerging market economies. This phase of the crisis has been very different. Um, the EMEs, the, cor the expansion of corporate debt, particularly in China, but in many emerging, many emerging market economies, has been quite spectacular. And uh, the BIS estimates at the end of 2016, 
global debt, that's the ratio of non-financial debt to GNE, global debt had risen from had risen to 232% of GDP, up from 192% in 2007. So far from deleveraging at the global level, there's been a massive expansion of debt. And one of the problems with that debt, it's debt issued by corporations that are themselves in bad shape, and a lot of the debt is in dollars. And these corporations don't earn dollars, they earn something else. So if you get a major appreciation of the US dollar, the debt servicing capacities of these people are gonna be really uh, challenged. Another thing is worsening wealth distribution. Asset prices have gone up a lot. And who owns the assets? And the answer is the rich people. So when people say we have an income distribution problem, a wealth distribution problem, they're right. And monetary policies made it worse. Uh, not saying they shouldn't have done what they did on those grounds alone, but let's just face facts, they've made it worse. And there's moral hazard everywhere from having very low interest rates. Um, people have got debts and have been encouraged to increase their debts because they think the debts are serviceable. And nobody more than the governments, okay? I uh, won't go into the details, but most governments in the advanced market economies are technically insolvent by a large margin. They cannot meet the contractual, no. They cannot meet the legislative obligations they have given themselves, okay? Now the question is, where does all that end? Because the governments are not addressing the debt problem, they're just continuing the way they are because the interest rates are so low. Then you can get into what I call the Sergeant Wallace Bern Bernholtz world, and perhaps we can come back to that in the question period, but that leaves you to hyperinflation. And I think we have a more dangerous situation today than in 2008. Um, where do we go from here? Well, we've used monetary policy to resolve the crisis, and it hasn't worked. So all of my earlier discussion about we're not out of the swamp yet, eh, it hasn't worked. And we have now a situation which the <coughs> BIS calls, this is my second bullet, BIS calls this the debt trap. Okay? And basically what it says is monetary policy can't continue doing what it's doing <coughs> because it's making things worse. Eh? But monetary policy can't stop doing what it's doing because that's going to trigger a crisis. So we have a problem. Logically, we have a problem. Monetary policy is not the way out, and it's got to be something else. And the something else has got to be governments. And governments should now do, and I've, I've submitted an op-ed on this to the Financial Times. I, they accept about half of the stuff that I do, so I have no idea whether they'll accept this one. But uh, it's called um, debt is now the elephant in the room, and basically suggesting that the governments have got to step in. And there's all sorts of things that they could do, but certainly the thing that would please Hayek is we, we have to address directly the debt problem. And the honest truth is that can only be done in an orderly way if we've got the legislation in place to do it, and we don't. So the problem of too big to fail banks is still out there, the problem of too big to save banks is out there, the problem of zombie companies where it's not clear what the legal resolution of their problems are is still out there. This is the number one thing to do. Structural reforms would also please Hayek, and I guess Pleasing Keynes is also important. You know, it's not an either-or world. Um, there are some countries that have got fiscal room for maneuver, and they should use it, uh, together with um, credible promises to do what needs to be done going forward to get the debt under control. This is a constant theme at the OECD, where I now spend a lot of time. So uh, there are things that need to be done, but only governments could do it. Debt reduction should be top of the list, um, but there are a variety of policies that can be followed. Where do we go from here? I'll do this very quickly because I'm told I'm running out of time, uh, as indeed I am. Um, 
what, what, what can we learn from this? Item number one, the most important thing is we're still in a mess and we got to get out of it. Okay, so survival is the first instinct of we got to deal with that. But there's no political will at the moment to accept we have a crisis and we have to get on with it. That's a real problem. But let's assume, okay, and this is in a way less relevant, let's assume that eventually we go back to a world that's more normal. Um, what are the lessons that we can learn? The debts have been dealt with and we're back in a more stock friendly world. What can we learn from complexity? Okay. This is my central point. What can we learn from complexity? Accepting that the economy is a complex adaptive system. First thing is these systems always break down. Okay. I went into that before. They always break down. Normally a combination of little things come together. They break down. The obvious lesson is be prepared. Okay? We were not prepared in 2008. We were not prepared in Europe in 2010, and we're not prepared now. Okay? All of the things that we need to do to recognize there will be a crisis, ex-ante preparations. Have you got memoranda of understanding okay? between the supervisory authorities, the central banks, the deposit insurance people, the regulators? Okay? Who does what? How do you avoid a, a, a total chaotic mess of a response? Okay. Uh, insolvency legislation. Okay. Even if all the debts are gone, we want to keep them gone. Okay. So we need insolvency legislation, even going forward, to make sure the debts don't... Debts are written off when they won't be serviced. Okay. Let's be honest. Ex post response. Do the central banks have the capacity to do lender of last resort, to do swaps? The need for flexibility. We're going backwards. I mentioned earlier on about the emerging market economies, the corporates have borrowed so much in dollars. The next crisis when it occurs, okay, there's going to be a huge shortage of dollars. Because okay, that's what everybody deals in. Who provides the dollars? The Fed. The Fed doesn't have to provide the dollars. In fact, Dodd-Frank gives you six separate reasons to hold back the Fed from doing lender of last resort the way they did it the last time, okay, to protect taxpayers' money. And lending to foreigners, okay, Congress is going to say, or there's a great danger, Congress is going to say, you, the Fed, you entered swap agreements with these foreign people from these countries um, without our consent. Okay? Uh, we're not, you can't do it. And we'll have a huge problem. And the who does what? Well, if taxpayers' money's on the line, finance ministries have to get involved. Okay? This whole issue is totally vague, gray, whatever. Institutional responsibility for crisis management, crisis re resolution, at the moment it is totally gray. It's not economics, but it pertains to economics, and it ought to be fixed. Prevention of future crises, I'll just say two things. One of them is that we must accept the fact that dynamic efficiency, which is the basis of sort of DSG, <coughs> is not the only game in town. We have to think in terms of future stability and all of the things that we can do to make the economy more robust. And one of the things that I would say we, we should do uh, is we should make our policies less ambitious. We should be willing to accept small downturns to cleanse the system in a Schumpeterian way, as opposed to just simply letting it all run, okay? and leaving ourselves open to still bigger crises and with potentially even bigger social and political ramifications. So we should be prepared to accept small downturns. The system itself should be revisited. We can use legislation, we can use all sorts of means to ensure that the system has got redundant, redundancy built in, um, modularity built in. There's a whole science out there called cybernetics, okay, which has to do with using feedback mechanisms and altering the character of systems to make them more stable. If you go to Wikipedia, now I haven't done this for about a year, but when I did this a year ago, there's a whole list. I mean, there must be two dozen disciplines that have benefited from cybernetics. And the one 
the one discipline that's missing is economics, which is extraordinary to me. So there's a lot of things that we can do. And financial stability, all I would say there is we need much more self and market discipline. <laughs> Reliance and regulation has gone far too far. Because the regulation itself assumes that the regulators understand what's going on, and they don't. And in any event, the system is constantly adapting. So that what they thought they understood is no longer the reality that they're regulating. So there's lots of stuff that we can do. Um, we need to monitor the system much more carefully. And I'll just go back to saying what I said in the lead up to the crisis. Inflation is not enough. It is not the only indicator there's problems coming down the road. There's all of these imbalances that we should be looking at. And it's all fuzzy and it's not as neat and clean as inflation. But that doesn't matter. That's the world in which we live. And we should be monitoring these imbalances. And we should be taking steps to, to lean against them. And uh, I have a bullet here about it's not just complex systems. It's adaptive systems. Big problem about fighting the last war. You know, the Maginot Line and all this kind of stuff. We always think the next crisis will look exactly the same as the last crisis, but it doesn't. And so that's an aspect of things that we should be very clear about. Um, this is my last so slide. All of my comments up until now have been about failures of policy <coughs> that rest upon the false premise that the domestic economy is a simple, understandable, linear system, and it isn't. It's a complex, adaptive system. But when you get to the international system, as the first bullet says, the international system is a complex system made up of complex systems. Uh, it's even more complex than all the others. And unfortunately, we also have a lot of beliefs about the international system that are just simply not true. And we're going to have to try to deal with those. First one is that spillovers, I mean, this is part of the Washington Consensus. If you keep your own house in order, there will be, and you have flexible exchange rates, there'll be no spillovers. Everything is fine. This is not true. And Helen Ray gave a very great uh, paper at Jackson Hole in 2000, I think in 13, 14, in which she basically said, you know, even, even with all of that stuff, capital controls, this kind of thing, is still, may still well have a role to play. Um, the international monetary system needs a nominal anchor. Remember on the gold system, the whole idea of the gold system basically was longer term price stability. We have nothing now at the international level. So you look at all of the major international central banks, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, the Fed, and the, they've all vastly expanded the monetary base. Okay. Now what kind of a threat does this pose to the international system going forward? The answer is we simply have no idea. It's totally unprecedented. But guys like Hayek, I guess, and von Mises and people like that would have been profoundly concerned about what they're seeing here. There is no nominal anchor for the whole system. Exchange rates are no longer working to control current account imbalances. Go into that in the question period. And what that implies is that you can get big imbalances that build up and build up, and you don't have a gentle kind of moderation of them <coughs> until the whole thing collapses, like happened in, like happened in Europe albeit for a different reason. And we have no tools. As I said before, and I finish with this, we have no tools because um, um, the dollars are in the hands of the Fed and Congress. And they may well have less interest in the future of the global financial system than the rest of us. And I won't say anything about this except that all of the stuff that I've said indicates to me that it's time for a total reset uh, but it's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because we've got an analytical deficit. That's been my whole presentation. The way we think about things is wrong, but changing the mindset is almost impossibly difficult. We can come back to that. We have an executive deficit. There's too much power in the hands of sovereign countries and not enough at the level of the international community or the barbell at the other end, the big municipal conglomerations, 
The power's in the wrong place, but they won't give it up. And lastly, and I spoke about this earlier on, we've got a democratic deficit that increasingly the stuff that needs to be done is the very opposite of what the guy in the street thinks needs to be done and what he or she wants to happen. So we've got some big problems out there. We have some prospective solutions, but actually getting to the solutions is going to be very tough. So good luck. I think we're all going to need it. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting at the front. That's very nice. Very keen to us. Uh, we are Clara and Julian from Option C, Development Path, and B, Finance. Uh, can, um, Clara is from Canada, and I'm from Argentina. And today we provide some comments about Mr. Um, Mr. White's paper, Conducting Monetary Policy in a Complex Adaptive Economy. Uh, to do so, first we are going to briefly summarize the paper and provide some context for you to better understand this. Then we are going to develop our own argument um, in the light of the contributions of Keynes and Hayek that are highlighted in the paper. Uh, then we would put forth m what we regard as Mr. White's contributions and finally some questions for discussion with the audience. Okay, so starting with some key points and the context. Um, we will first look at how economy is a complex adaptation Adaptive system, sorry, I have the reflex of saying adaptative, I don't know why, hopefully it will not <laughs> prevent you from understanding anything. Um, we will then discuss the state, the current state of crisis and the role of institution. So, is economy a machine? So, I don't know if you've seen this representation of the economy is a machine, you have this fluid going and changing certain level, inflation is going up, um, uh, GDP is going up and down, and then it's because of this flow. So you can understand it through a machine. That was done in the 50s. <laughs> um, but what William uh, White's contribution is, is actually trying to understand it um, on the contrary as a complex adaptative system. So this also finds roots in evolutionary and complexity economics and also in social sciences. So the aspect of politics is important, the aspect of behavior is important. Um, and it leads to another definition of uh, economic system. Hudson, for example, uh, with evolutionary economics was describing the economy as an organism, not a machine. And uh, Anderson and Arrow from the Santa Fe Institute created actually a working group on economy as an evolving complex system. Similarly, uh, White, and I'm going to quote him uh, now, uh, the economy is not an understandable control and controllable machine as assumed by conventional macroeconomics theory. Rather, the uh, economy is a complex adaptative system, adaptive system, like many others in nature and society, in which policy can have significant unintended consequences. So this is the big starting point. Uh, now, from this, we are uh, um, understanding that we are in a state of crisis. The, the 2008 crisis is not finished, and we need to um, take into consider uh, consideration history. So, more than being a complex system that is, not, uh, that is prone to crisis, economy is also path-dependent. So, using this lens uh, of complex and adaptive system, uh, it allows us to acknowledge um, the creation of imbalances and observe them with, uh, for instance, uh, the remaining high prices of equity uh, and stocks and many more uh, examples that you gave before. Um, so this points to the state of crisis, but it also points to the uh, importance uh, and potential of historical analysis for, for understanding the system. So complex adaptative system, they inevitably break down in spite of the effort of increasing their robustness. This is a strong point of the paper, and it can call also to the to Minsky contribution, where he says um, in 78, there is inherent and inescapable flaws in capitalism. So continuing on the state of crisis, um, there is uh, roots, macroeconomic roots to this phenomena of, of crisis uh, and, and calls back to many decades. These imbalances 
um, indicates the fragility of the system as a whole and the possibility of phase shift of significant proportion. It causes also this, this difficulty of the, the shift. Um, and what is interesting is actually that one of our contribution, hopefully in this presentation, is actually to underline Keynes and Hayek's roles in the paper. And they found themselves in also a crisis situation. Um, so we just thought it was interesting to underline. A strong point is that central bank cannot go back and cannot continue doing what they have been doing in the paper. Um, so we will develop a bit more on how this state of crisis um, and <laughs> this leads uh, to a discussion on the role of institutions. So looking back at the old events, central bank generally failed to identify the new waves of the old tre uh, trend um, to stability, like capital inflow. White considers that there is a higher role to play for governments um, and that central bank had the false belief, and this is important, it was said in the presentation before, that they have the false belief that achieving stable prices uh, is a sufficient condition for avoiding macroeconomic problem. So before detail detailing a bit what are the policies uh, implication and proposition in the paper and also the role of the institution, we need to talk a bit about scholarship. So I mentioned how Keynes and Hayek are uh, playing a, an important role uh, and that we want to detail that. I uh, also mentioned that there is a degree of pluralism in understanding economy as a complex adaptive system. So I will leave um, uh, Julian in detail. Okay. So what is remarkable and striking about Mr. White's presentation is that we are faced with Schumpeter, Minsky, Hayek, Keynes, Friedman, and so many other authors that a priori will seem at least incompatible or in the opposite sides of what we will call the economic thought. So we thought this was a really interesting contribution and we, because it highlights the fertility within the economics profession and it also points out to the relationship of economics with the other sciences. This is a really important contribution and we'd like to detail a little bit more on this and also mention the caveats of this uh, approach. Among all these uh, um, scholars that have been mentioned, two have a prominent role in Mr. White's proposition. The first one is lying in the background but constantly and we are reminded of him, is Mr. Hayek. This was a new Austrian economist, really important in the 30s, which engaged in a debate with Mr. with Mr. Keynes, which needs, of course, no presentation here. The interesting thing is that these two thinkers have been commonly highlighted as being the representative of state intervention in the economy, gearing the system, and on the other hand, free, the free market. So it's interesting to point out what are the common features of these two um, aspects before going to the differences. So first, and most strikingly, they share a common methodological critique. And this is emphasized in the reject of formalistic modeling in, in Hayek's view, and in also in the role of radical uncertainty and in the role of fundamental uncertainty in Keynes, which follow a logical approach. And he even, if we consider the foundation of post keynesian economics, attacks Mike, uh, Mikhail Kaleski on these grounds. He uh, atta attacked the purely empirical approach of Mikhail Kaleski. <coughs> then, with regard to the presentation, we'll, like to point, we'll just point out on two issues which are the business cycle theory behind Austrian and Keynesian, spe specifically post-Keynesian economics. We are not going to focus here on new Keynesian economics, which is part of the mainstream, and the policy prescription for the crisis. So the Austrian this, um, theory of the business cycles and crisis is pretty much related to a diagnosis that Mr. Wise made of the crisis. This is influenced, strongly influenced, but false beliefs of economic agents, but above all, and here is the focus of the central bank. This false belief was rooted in these flawed models, but it's basically that they said artificially low interest rates, rates below the natural rate that foster excessive credit growth and malinvestment. How can you see this malinvestment in these zombie companies that are kept in the book of the banks? On the other hand, we cannot properly speak about uh, properly Keynesian theory of the business cycle because we have this thing about the animal spirits with the sudden shifts in behavior. Nevertheless, if we go to the post-Keynesian side legacy of Minsky, 
uh, we have the financial stability hypothesis, arguing that uh, financial economies are inherently stable and that periods of stability breed instability. So this is kind of an endogenous feature of the system. Interestingly enough, Minsky has a strong Austrian influence coming from Schumpeter, so creative destruction and the relationship be between those, these two schools can be seen. Finally, the policy prescriptions are remarkably different, although they share a common methodological critique. While for Hayek, fiscal and monetary stimulus are just more of the same co um, policies that, the that caused the crisis in the first place, and Mr. White's point out regarding the 2008 crisis, we are trying to solve the crisis by doing easy money policies that we have already implemented. In Keynes policy, we need expansionary monetary, but mainly fiscal policy, and this is a point that is usually overlooked. On top of that, we cannot financial regulation. So, uh, and Mr. White went through this in his presentation. He says, on the demand side, and to please Keynes, we must uh, have an expansionary fiscal policy, investment in infrastructure in concert with the private sector, and a higher wage share, which uh, Mr. White didn't mention here, but it's mentioned in the paper. On the supply side, if you want the long term, we must follow Hayek's advice, we are told. For this, we need careful debt write-offs and restructuring, which is actually perfectly compatible with the post keynesian thinking and recently proposals, for example, like a stick keen, um, that is QE for the people policy that we must, that we must do QE on the condition that people first pay off their debts. And here, this is not controversial, the second policy is called, and he mentioned this passing by, structural reforms to, ref, to raise productivity, growth potential, and the capacity to service debt. So, although it's really interesting, these two traditions merging together, there are some tensions here that we'll like to highlight. For lack of uh, time, we'll just highlight one in order to give, like, to show what this is about. So we wonder, what are structural reforms? Because they are not defined in the paper. So we went to the OECD, where Mr. White works, and then, but the best definition we came up was uh, with M Williams' white presentation to the ambassadors of the OECD two months ago, where he said that structural reforms are, among, uh, among other things, to ensure the reduction of employment protection legislation. Between, and unfortunately, the progress of these policies is not being uh, pursued. Now we wonder, given that the reduction of employment protection legislation diminishes workers' bargaining power, and therefore diminishes the growth, the growth uh, rate of wages, how can this be complemented with a higher wage share of factory income that is, being, uh, that is being highlighted in the previous slide? So, combining different theories is important. Cross-fertilization is really important, but we must be aware of the drawbacks of, such, of these approaches, and where shall we pick and put on this crisis? On top of that, on the diagnosis of the crisis, uh, false beliefs are emphasized. But the false, uh, it's not only that borrowers and lenders had this false belief that they could go on debt forever, but this is, was also caused because a massive structural shift in capitalism, which was financialization and the regressive income distribution. People went to debt because they have to, in order to keep up on with the consumption levels. So this is not really a false belief, but a structural flaw in capitalism. Okay, uh, we will now underline certain contributions from the paper. Um, there is the proposition of uh, allying to tradition, as we said, um, which is for us a bold contribution uh, toward more, in a way, theoretical pluralism in economics. Because there is uh, this strong dichotomy of the left-oriented versus right-oriented, or this pro-state versus pro-government, which is too much of a simplification, and we know this by now. So here it's a bold contribution in order to move forward. Um, and uh, the concept of complex adapta uh, adaptive system um, is also very core, and um, the focus on the fact that it inevitably breaks down in spite of the effort to increase robustness um, is a very good contribution too. The need for paradigm shift, I think, being in this master, we, we, we are all agreeing on this. Um, but also acknowledging the limit in our understanding of the economy is, is core. Another contribution is that um, the, the importance of the role of government. So central bank can, not only, can only buy time for governments uh, in the paper for solving the crisis. 
Now, if the economy is path dependent, um, in the current historical point uh, and imbalance, uh, they are informative of, for our understanding of policy. Um, and given this, it's interesting to see how the different crises are. So Hayek and Keynes were finding themselves in different crises. So allying them now with more information and under their historical point is also uh, something very interesting. So we can uh, build from their theory and their insights. Um, and uh, we need to recognize the partial uh, complementarity of, uh, of Hayek and Keynes. And uh, maybe it's our bias, but also with um, post keynesians Okay, so finally we'll leave, you s we'll leave some questions maybe for further discussion, although we don't have to address them. Mainly, what is the role of the coordination between central banks and governments? how to remove unnecessary complexity in the system, and if you see any role for SFC models in the post keynesian tradition in modeling the economy, given that many of the principles that you mentioned at the beginning are highly compatible with agent-based and SFC models. Uh, and if you can detail which other tools can be used for this. Thank you very much for listening to us. So we, uh, we leave this question up. Uh, maybe you also want to come back to the tensions or to the contribution or to any elements. Um, we'll give you maybe 10 minutes to, uh, to kind of answer those. Um, and after, we will answer more questions from the room. Um, would you like to sit here? Yeah, or? yeah, I'll come up, yeah. yeah. Okay. We can leave them here also. Yeah. So you have them in front of you. Sure, super, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Very, very thoughtful and uh, I was, I was very pleased to see that, uh, that model that uh, Bill Phillips constructed, which is, I think, still at the, still at the LSE. Um, Phillips was an engineer, of course, and uh, he, he actually did a lot of very early stuff on uh, uh, stabilization. So there's a very famous article of his, not as famous as the Phillips curve thing, <laughs> but uh, an article in which he looked at alternative feedback rules. So we had an adaptive feedback rule, uh, an integrated uh, feedback rule, a, a what is it, a, a, there was a third one, I forget now, but actually the, 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 the thing that he showed, and I actually used it in my PhD thesis, was that the feedback rule can be very um, instrumental in determining whether an economy stabilizes or whether it destabilizes. And it's not hard to show that you can uh, devise rules that in fact will make things much worse than otherwise. Which of course is back to the cybernetic stuff about feedback and positive and negative feedback and whatever. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, one thing you didn't mention, your first slide, was the, the sort of the origins of this stuff about sort of the think about the economy as a complex adaptive system. The, the funny thing is the roots of this have been around for a very long period of time. And something I just read, I, I guess I'd read it before, but I'd forgotten. Darwin's basic idea from evolution came from Malthus that it was Malthus who was talking about, you know, the competition between people and the striving to get resources and the fact that growing populations would mean increasingly people would be forced into penury, et cetera, et cetera. That idea of a competition for scarce resources was the basic idea that led Darwin to say, I think I've got a theory to go with the facts that he'd been collecting. So it's sort of interesting that this, how can I say, we think about biology as sort of, you know, the ultimate sort of examples of complex adaptive systems. But the idea, the basic idea of how it all worked actually came from an economist, Thomas Malthus. 
And what's even more interesting, in a way, is with that as the beginning. And I said earlier on, you know, that um, maybe we're going back to the idea of the classical economists, is that somehow those kinds of thoughts just got lost for a long period of time as the, as the models became more and more deterministic. And what's really interesting in a way, and this is the realm totally of psychology and sociology, is how is it that we could have lost such good ideas for such a long period of time and embraced bad ideas for such a long period of time? That's a really interesting question, but it's nothing to do with economics per se. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to note was you, you, you suggested that uh, there's a kind of contradiction in my thinking and that I wanted to lower employment <coughs> protection or sort of reverse employment protection legislation uh, and, and raise wages and that you know, these two things are antithetical. In fact, I, I don't think they are. Um, for, for a starter, this is not about workers' rights. This is about some workers' rights. This really all has to do with insiders and outsiders. And for those of you who are familiar particularly with the workings of the Greek economy, the Italian economy, the Spanish economy, and even the French economy, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that you have a whole group of people who legislation really, really protects. And so they have a good job and it's a protected job and it's probably a reasonably high paying job. And the upshot of it is that the employers confronted with this package of rights that they have to give to the workers that they've already employed their reaction is, if that's what comes with hiring a worker, I'm not going to hire any more workers. And it's the young people that are bearing the brunt of all of this. They're the outsiders, and these sort of older people with the vested rights are the insiders. And the OECD's approach to it, which I very strongly support, is, is it's a three-pronged stool, which is often known as the, the Danish approach. Although the Danes basically say, yeah, it works better than anything else, but it's still not perfect. The three-pronged approach, really, to reforming labor markets is you get rid of much of employment protection legislation. So you get, try to get rid of the insider-outsider thing. You recognize that now holding a job is going to be a more dangerous, obviously a good thing, but a more dangerous thing than having a job with employment protection legislation. So the answer is you need better safety nets and safety nets directed to individuals, not to sectors. Okay? So we're not going to spend huge amounts of government money supporting, let's say, uh, a, a car industry that is under threat from competition from other countries but we are going to take steps to ensure that anybody who loses his job has training, help, etc. The third stool is what they call um, active labor market policies, which is governments really should be ensuring that there's databases out there so that people can know where the jobs are available, can help them get the skills that they need to do the jobs that are available. So it's all a kind of package. Um, having said that, um, I don't think that employment protection legislation in itself gives you higher wages. Okay? I think, in fact, uh, the way things have been working, and we'll go back to the empirical work, is that the, the process in which um, we, we've, we've actually had a world in which we've had a lot of employment protection. And yet, you look at the last couple of decades, workers' share has been going down and down. Okay, so there's something else at work here. Um, I think this is still sort of, what's the word? To try to determine what it is, is not, it's not so obvious. Um, I was at a, I was at a meeting at the OECD last Thursday and Friday, 
and uh, we got on to this sort of general topic. And one of the speakers was actually focusing on monopoly power, that there's an increasing amount of monopoly power virtually everywhere. I mean, we're, we're seeing consolidation, concentration in industries all over the world. And specialization, of course, also means that you get a, what's the word? There's only maybe a couple of firms in the world that will sort of have specialization in a certain part that goes into cars for all the companies. So they're getting more and more power. And one's first thought is, well, that'll push up prices. But the odd thing about it is that prices have not been going up faster than we'd expected. They've been going up less fast than we expected. Something's going on here that still is a, is a big open question. So anyway, back to the EPL thing. I think these things are, are to totally consistent. What I'm saying is we've got to find out what the reasons are that the wage share has been diminishing as much as it has and do something about it. Because it's not even in the interests of the owners of capital. It's not in their interest longer term to see the current situation continue. And the reason for that it goes back to the stuff I was talking about, the joint interaction between the economic and the political, that if the economic situation becomes bad enough for enough people, something will happen. And that something will be war, revolution, um, famine, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And someone's just written a book, and I, I've it's on my list, and I haven't bought it yet, but I'm going to buy it. And it's uh, precisely about income inequality and how it always gets redressed in the end. Okay? So this problem, we look at it now as a problem of non-inclusiveness, growing income inequality. This study basically says, don't worry, this will sort itself out in the end. But the way in which it sort of sorts itself out is precisely what I just said, which is war, revolution, famine. It is not a happy ending. So it's in everybody's best interest to try to moderate all this stuff, including the owners of capital. So um, anyway, your very specific questions about the role of central banks and governments in all of this. Um, that is a very difficult and totally unresolved issue. And um, the IMF did a study, I think back around 2012, in which they looked at the question of who does what with respect to the regulatory stuff, both microprudential and macroprudential, although there was less of it then than there is now, and the normal central banking stuff. And I think they came up with something like six basic models, 14 sub-models. Everybody does it differently. And the reason why they do it differently is not just history. But, uh, history plays a pretty big role. They, we, we do it this way because it's sort of the way we've always done it, path dependent. You know, that's how we got here. But the point is that there's no theory to guide it. So it just is what it is. So there's just my, my sense at the moment is that the, the business about the independence of central banks uh, has always been oversold. And there will be a kind of drawing back from that. And in a way, it's sort of obvious because as soon as you s accept this business about complex adaptive, all the bits are interacting with all the other bits. And the idea that you can just say, well, I'm going to do my little bit, and I'm totally separate from the others. I, I've got trouble with that. Um, the other thing is on the, on the financial stability side. You know, the central banks for a long period of time said, all we focus on is price stability. Okay? Financial stability is somebody else's department. Well, the, the, the problem with that, of course, is that it denies the very roots of central banking. Because when you go back to the early days, you know, the establishment of the Bank of England in particular, it was essentially about somebody being there as a backstop, as a lender of last resort. So financial stability has been at the heart of central banking for centuries. And to sort of say, no, we don't do that, it's just sort of inherently odd. You know? 
So now, anyway, the central banks are increasingly realizing that they can't walk away from financial stability. I mean, they've got a role to play. And they don't like it so much because it makes their life more complicated. And you can measure price stability and you can't measure financial stability. You only know it when you don't have it. So they don't like the fact that it makes their life more complicated. But if that's the way the world is, they're going to have to get used to it. So um, I think independence as such, you know, central banks going their own way, that's, I think that's finished. What is very important, and again, I don't know how to answer this question, is that whether it's on the price stability side, the financial stability side, whatever, the central bankers and the other technicians, you know, the regulators, whatever, have got to be free from short-term political interference in the interests of winning the next election. Okay, that's something that we really do have to try to maintain. And when you think about the mandates that central banks have been given by legislators for price stability, and I say this with personal experience on the Canadian side, but I think this is going on elsewhere. The legislate the legislators understand that their political interference will have bad implications over time. And in sensible countries, the legislators have said to the central banks and the regulators, we give you the capacity to operate independently. Okay? They gave away the power short-term interference because they knew it was a bad thing to do. In many countries it still continues, but we've got to maintain that, what is known in the, in the literature as um, instrument independence. That these agencies have got to be able to use the powers that they have in the right way, in an independent way. And that's known as p instrument independence. It's quite different from the blanket term independence, which I think is often wrongly used. Because if you've got a central bank, for example, who has a mandate from the government, okay, they're a creature of government. If you've got a central bank which is accountable to government, they're a creature of government. So the broad sort of sense, independence, I, I don't think people should use that. And at the Bank of Canada, we never used it. Um, you should really be thinking about this narrower thing. Is I, you, you've given me the powers to use, and I have to be able to use those powers in an independent way. So, but I think the implications for the institutional stuff is still undergoing, is still under, underway. There will be a big difference, too, between the advanced countries and the emerging market countries. Uh, I just spoke to this as a topic at the South African Reserve Bank, uh, which is itself under threat in various ways, as you all know. And um, there, I think in most emerging markets, the honest truth is that there's a smaller pool of people who are technically expert. And it probably makes more sense to put them all in a single place, to pay them good salaries, uh, to make sure that they don't succumb to corruption. Um, I remember being at the, the um, Monetary Authority of Singapore and asking the managing director, uh, why is there no corruption in Singapore? And his answer was, because we pay our civil servants extremely well, and if they misbehave, we put them in prison. It seemed to me, as the English would say, fair enough. <laughs> um, second question about uh, removing unnecessary complexity, how you do that. Again, this is an enormously difficult uh, task. I mean, if you look at a company like uh, Citicorp or any of the big banks, they will have literally thousands of subs, okay? Thousands of subs and thousands of branches. And, um, and trying to force them to change the business model is not gonna, is not gonna be easy. But I do think that um, you, you can look at the three recent developments in the course of the last 20 years, the complexity has come from three things. Uh, one of which is marketization, um, what is it? Marketization, consolidation, and globalization. 
Uh, and these have been characteristic of the last 20 years in financial markets. And all of these things should be looked at very closely with a look towards rolling stuff back. So for globalization, um, I guess what I'd say, we should be thinking much more strongly about the, much more carefully about requiring people to use subs as opposed to branches. So that you know every sort of national bank, let's say BNP, you know, it would have a sub someplace. And the sub would be capitalized. And the sub would have a separate board. And the country in which the sub worked, you know, the government would know who to go to when things, were, when things went badly. Uh, if everything's done at a different level, so it's a, a, a branch as opposed to a sub, uh, then it can get extremely messy because you have to go back to the head office. And the head office, of course, will be protected by the country that's responsible for the head office. So you'll have things like, uh, although in Lehman's case it was inadvertent, where, let's say, a company will know that it's in trouble in a particular country and may reduce a lot of the liquidity in the capital that it holds there to bring it back to a place like New York where the French government can't get at it, okay? Which just adds an element of instability into the whole thing. So I'm not saying I'm totally convinced of what I'm saying here. I'm just saying we should be thinking much more about that. Globalization, branches as opposed, sorry, subs as opposed to branches. Consolidation, uh, I didn't mention this when I was speaking, absence of time, but when you think about what happened during the crisis, okay, we started off with the banks were too big to fail. In many countries, the banks are now vastly bigger than they were before, okay? Because the chosen way to deal with the financial problems was to merge weak banks with strong banks. Of course, in the limit, if you get a strong bank and put them in charge of enough weak banks, then the strong bank becomes a weak bank, as opposed to the other way around, okay? And there's been a lot of that. I mean, in the States and in the UK, banks are a lot bigger, probably in Europe, in, in Germany now, Ger it's starting in Germany, the process of consolidation. Um, yeah, I misspoke there, because in Germany it would be a good thing. But in some of the countries where the banking system was already pretty highly sort of uh, consolidated, making the big guys even bigger, then you move from the too big to, what is it, too big to fail, to being too big to save. That uh, if banks get big enough, the government doesn't have the resources to bail them out if things go belly up, and then you get a disorderly sort of, you know, insolvency. So consolidation, I mean, we should be looking closely at that. And the other aspect of these great big institutions, there's absolutely no evidence, as far as I know, that these really big institutions provide economies of scale. Yeah, that, uh, and, and they often tend to be sort of very hard to manage. They're just so big that it's in complex adapt. It becomes so big and complex that nobody, nobody really understands it, even Jamie Dimon. That's, that's dangerous. And then the third thing was uh, what I call securitization, which is the move away from banks into um, credit that is provided through other sources. And that there I'm even on less sure ground about what's the right way to go, to be honest. Because if you keep stuff within the banks, uh, then you might at least have the possibility of sort of referring to what I said in my presentation, you know, self-interest. So you, you self-discipline. You know, you, you basically um, force the banks to take the losses uh, themselves, get rid of the safety nets. Uh, you can give bankers, I guess, courses in fiduciary trust. Uh, you can insist upon relationship banking. You have to know your client before you give them large amounts of money. With markets, fintech, distributive credit availability, there the things that I've just talked about are less possible but because the sources of credit are 
much, much more diverse. You can take bankruptcies. They're all sort of semi-little bankruptcies, and they don't have the same sort of systemic influence. But there, I'm giving a lecture on this in a, in a little while. It's, it's not so easy to draw a firm conclusion about what should be done. But in all of these areas, efforts to sort of look at unneeded complexity and get rid of them, uh, I think would be welcome. And we know for a fact that there's lots of complexity that has been built into the system simply because they want the complexity to keep the regulators out of it. And that kind of stuff you know, really should be taken a look at. And the, the last thing, what, what is S, I'm sorry, what does SFC model stand for? Stock flow consistent. Ah, stock flow consistent, okay. We built the first of these at the Bank of Canada, I think, back in the 1980s. And uh, I'm actually, I'm not so sure I'm proud of this, but I was actually the chief of the research department at the Bank of Canada when we developed Q, uh, uh, first of all, was SAM, the small annual model. And in those days, the, the computing power was so limited that we had to use annual models as opposed to quarterly models because we couldn't impose all the consistencies using, using quarterly data. We just couldn't handle all the numbers. Okay. Um, but SAM was the first of those models. And the, then we developed QPF, which is the court, uh, Q, QFM. A quarterly forecasting model, which was much the same. They had stock flow consistency built into it. All of the balance sheets, in the end, had to be time consistent, so you, you couldn't blow up. You know, there was always forces to... Um, and the guys that did that uh, took it to... Uh, Doug Laxton took, took it to the IMF. Um, Bob Tetlow took it to the Fed. Uh, David Rose took it to the Riksbank in Sweden. These models that originally came from the Bank of Canada have gone everywhere. And as I say, I'm sort of proud of them at the analytical level. But when I look at them from the more practical perspective, these may well have been evil <laughs> as opposed to technically competent uh, developments. So uh, the ACE modeling is... Um, it, it, look at the, the, the SFC stuff, the consistency... Is, is very important. But there should be much more emphasis on the fact that the feedback effects have to occur to enforce the consistency. Because at the moment, this is not what's happening in the real world. And so the models might say, oh, it's all going to be OK because we enforce the consistency. But if the consistency is interest rates go up, and the honest reality in the world is that the central banks decide not to raise the interest rates, and the models are immaterial because the conditions under which everything's going to be OK are not met in the real world. We have a problem. On the ACE modeling, um, I'm about 2 thirds of the way through a book on uh, complex adaptive uh, systems and their applications to social models. Absolutely fascinating. But it is, I will tell you honestly, stretching my mathematical and uh, statistical capacities. Um, but I'm glad that there are a lot of people out there that are becoming increasingly interested in this stuff and uh, increasingly capable of, of doing the modeling. And uh, what's really interesting about, the, about this stuff, aside from all of that, is it raises the must. As soon as you bring real people into it, it, it raises the concept of what are the things that characterize or influence how they behave? And in this one book that I'm reading, he goes back to the Buddha. This is funny. I mean, it's sort of the deep philosophical elements in all of this stuff, which is sort of right thinking, right knowing, right seeing. Okay, And it's all to do with, do you have the right objective? How much do you know? How much do other people know about what you know? I mean, it gets enormously complicated, but it, they're all deeply sort of part of human nature. And, and it's interesting that sort of the religions, as it were, have sort of picked up on all of this stuff. What do you need to know to have a right, what's the word, a right functioning society? And we're talking about what do you need to know in order to have a right 
or what are the characteristics required for a right functioning economy? But underneath it all, it's all the same stuff. And uh, the people that do these models, one of the things that they do insist on is that it doesn't matter what discipline, okay? It's totally interdisciplinary because the, the, the way in which these complex adaptive systems work is all the same. Whether you're talking about complex systems, social systems, uh, social networks, underneath it all, it's all the same kind of processes. Uh, the behavioral things, the right seeing, the right knowing, all this kind of stuff might well differ, okay? But it's sort of the same questions, maybe different answers, but underlying it all, it's the same mathematics and the same sort of, you know, absolutely fascinating. And uh, I made reference, I'll finish with this. I made reference earlier on to this book uh, about uh, rediscovering classical economics. And um, the guy who wrote it is David Simpson, who's a professor emeritus at uh, Sterling University. And uh, the point that he makes, he's got the classical economists here and this new sort of ace modeling, okay, here. And the link is the recognition of complexity and adaptivity. Okay? And the human link in it is Hayek. And Hayek came up with some of these ideas back in the 1960s, okay? But the, the way that, the, the way you have to think about it is that all Hayek had was a story, okay? Because that's all they could handle in those days. And there's nothing wrong with stories, okay? I mean, this is, uh, this, this current book that I'm reading sort of basically puts, in the sort of the, the, what's the word, in, in, trying to think of his name now, the rhetoric of economics. You know, the, the rhetoric of economics is the arguments that you use to prove something. And on the one hand, you've got, you know, formal, theoretical, hardcore, mathematical models. And at the other end, you've got a story. And these computational models are sort of somewhere in between, right? So I'm not disparaging stories, okay? I think sometimes, particularly, the more complex you want to get it, sometimes the only thing you've got is a story, but I think this is how it works. But the sort of the complexity and these computational models, which are somewhere in the middle, um, are actually very, um, very, very useful. And Whereas Hayek only had a story, now we've got big data and we've got big computer power. And you can do stuff today that, uh, like I was at this meeting Thursday and Friday at the OECD and uh, it was jointly organized by the BIS, the financial people, uh, the IMF, the demand side people, and the OECD, the supply side people, which was in itself a recognition of the fact that all three of these things are all deeply, deeply interrelated. And all of these institutions should be thinking about it in a systemic way. I mean, I thought that meeting was historic in, in that sense, okay? But anyway, when we got, the, 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 the focus really was on financial influences on productivity and potential. Some of the stuff that I spoke about earlier on about zombie companies and how they affect others and new loans for new ideas and all this kind of stuff. But a lot of work going on, okay, about, uh, about this sort of stuff. And uh, people now capable of going back into credit registers, banking data, and matching it up with firm data and sort of seeing who gets the money and how much of an influence it has and whether they survive or whether they don't survive. You know, it really sort of very interesting modeling work. In a traditional kind of way, actually. I mean, in the end, you wind up with sort of linear regressions that are based on, you know, this or that. But the really interesting thing to me was um, focusing on the number of, you know, you always sort of the bottom, you get the R squared and the, you know, and the number of observations. And some of these studies have got millions of observations. And uh, when I first started off, um, like I was saying earlier on with RDX2, the early days at the Bank of Canada. Um, you know, you might have 
a time series. There was no cross section. You might have a time series of 50, 50 observations. So, you know, from that to a million. So we, we can do stuff now that we couldn't do before. Um, I'll just finish with a story. I, one of the first things I did when I went to the Bank of Canada, this was in the heyday of monetarism. You know, I said right at the beginning, we've gone through many, many cycles of different ways of thinking in monetary theory. And when I was at the Bank of Canada, uh, monetarism was just really starting to come to the fore. And the essence of monetarism was uh, demand for money function. So um, I was set to work as a young guy estimating demand for money functions for Canada. Uh, M1, M2, M3, blah, blah, blah. And uh, anyway, I published a work uh, essentially on M1, which we thought was the best sort of vehicle for applying a monitor's platform of control. And uh, somebody did a review of it, picked it up, put it in the paper, and said, Mr. White, I think I had about 50 data observations, you know, time series, well, maybe 100. And he said, this is a very impressive piece of work. Mr. White has done everything with this data except take it down to the basement and beat it with a rubber hose, which I thought was sort of amusing. Um, and when you think about it, the old methodologies, again, back to human nature here, every time you do a regression, you really ought to say to yourself, you're losing a degree of freedom. You know, you've actually got one less observation than you thought you had. But we never do that. You just mine the data and mine the data and mine the data until you get something that works. And I did it for a while, and everybody did it for years. I could see everybody laughing. You're still doing it. <laughs> um, but that's the truth. I mean, you should start with hypothesis. And every time you sort of change the specification or, you know, you should say, well, that's one degree of freedom lost, and then you start changing your test of significance accordingly. And you pretty soon get to the point where I began this lecture, which is you realize you know far less than you thought you knew. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering to, uh, to the question and interacting with them very well. Um, now we will open to the room. Um, so we have some time to, uh, to take some questions. Uh, maybe some Austrians want to talk about AIC, maybe. OK. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kasper. I'm from option B, which is the macroeconomics option. Um, you talked about that you think uh, monetary policy has been too lax. So I'm assuming you mean that you think interest rates should be raised. Is that correct? Um, not, not, not really. Not really. This gets us back to the path dependency and the debt trap that I was talking about. Because we are where we are. I, I guess what I'm saying is we never should have done what we did. But it's a bit like the UK going into Europe. You know? But you think it's interest rates have become to say you never should have done it. But once you've done it, you start from where you are. And raising interest rates at this point is going to be a very tricky thing. OK, yeah. But you think that interest rates have become too low, that they shouldn't have been lowered in the first place. Yeah. But do you think that is the problem with um, problematic debts we have now, or the problem is that we don't have appropriate regulation when it comes to collateral or uh, loan-to-value ratios or that kind of things? Because I don't see how higher interest rates would be... I mean, sure, lower interest rates may have led to an increase in debt, but the quality of the debt, so the, the, the problematic debt, can, you can still have that when you have very high interest rates. In fact, it may, have, may, may lead to speculation and a uh, lot of risk taking. And um, I think you talked a lot about debt, but you didn't really um, define what kind of debt really is problematic for you. So I, I think what we've seen in the past decade and before the crisis was uh, a strong increase in unproductive debt. So especially household debt. So could, could you maybe say some more about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's many. You. Um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, but, but please mind and, and feel free to tell me. Uh, we will take two more questions, and then 
do one round of answer. Uh, I'm Maria from Option B as well, now in macroeconomics, uh, and I would like to know what's your opinion uh, on, for example, the situation that happens in Brazil at the moment, because uh, you have been arguing, for example, that uh, Keynesian type of policy of fiscal stimulus should be adopted where there's actually room for maneuver, and as we have seen in Brazil, the whole crisis started when there was if no space for maneuver, a bit of space for maneuver, and with the decline in the economy, this space has been uh, taken away. That's an accounting identity because if the GDP goes down, also the taxation, that uh, the income that the government gets from taxation also comes down, so the space of maneuver disappears. And what should have been done in this sense? And also concerning the situation in developing countries, something that has not been mentioned is the fact that there's actually a currency hierarchy in the world. So is there a currency? Yeah, hierarchy. So the currencies don't have the same power yeah. and so on and so forth. Though. So that's also this problem. And a third point is regarding the independence of the central bank and the mandate of the central bank. In the Brazilian central bank, the mandate is to control price stability, and uh, we don't have a mandate that is uh, regarding, for example, the level of activity and employment. Uh, and this has been the case for several years. Uh, the problem in Brazil, nevertheless, is how the interest of the technocrats of the central bank are pursued uh, in their self-benefit of uh, profiting from the level of interest rates that are established in the country. So uh, I would like to know what's your opinion on that. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, um, Benedict. I'm also from Option B, so macroeconomics, and I'm from Germany. Uh, I have two questions that are economic. Um, uh, economics questions and one question is kind of like strategically what can be done about the situation of the profession. So the first thing is regarding what you said um, of the effect of the breakdown of the communist bloc essentially that then opened us new labor markets and then that put pressure on wages and therefore it kept inflation low if I understood you correctly. So that essentially means you have in the back of your mind a conflict inflation uh, understanding of what pushes up prices. If that is correct, or if that is how inflation is being driven, it all comes down to bargaining power in the end. And so therefore, I don't really understand how that statement, oh, it was the opening of the labor markets and the liberalization um, that put pressure on wages, uh, works with... Um, it's not bargaining power that drives the wage share. Second question is regarding um, your, your view on regulation. I perfectly understand that you say, okay, regulation is very hard, <laughs> maybe not, e not even feasible because regulators actually need to understand what they're regulating and therefore we m should rely on market discipline. But isn't Correctly, like market discipline that really works, also a form of regulation that is imposed externally to the market system um, and therefore also needs regulators. And so it becomes a governance question uh, of how can we actually train regulators that they're not boring uh, bureaucrats but active and dynamic people that understand the economy. And just a very brief example. Uh, the blockchain, what's happening there, because that's an extreme example of a parallel finance system that's growing like crazy and completely unregulated. Uh, and I don't see how that system would ever stabil stabilize itself if there is not someone from the exterior imposing certain rules on it. And then my last... Yeah, I think we're already yeah, up to yeah, about 10 okay. questions, so... Uh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so maybe to try to have another round of question, uh, this can be uh, maybe the one that uh, trying to focus a bit. I'm, I'm sorry, actually, uh, if, if I don't, uh, what's the word? Having chunks of questions, I may miss, I've forgotten some of the nuances of, the, of, of each one of them. But on the first question about, um, really about the role of, of regulation and, and monetary policy, 
Um, I guess my view is that in the good times, you know, if we're thinking here in terms of these long, long financial cycles of credit boom and, and bust, um, the BIS at least has been in the record for years as saying that both the regulatory and the monetary side should be aware of the imbalances that are building up and that they should be prepared to lean against them. Now, leaning, using regulatory means to lean against credit excesses, that is the definition of macroprudential. Sort of microprudential is sort of you set the rules, as it were, for all time so that the system will be generally stable and, you know, whatever. Um, the macroprudential has got a, a kind of time series element to it that it can, the, the, the regulations can change over time. And they change in recognition of the fact that the system itself can be generated, can, can, can become unstable. So macroprudential, the essence of it is time varying and a systemic objective. Um, I think, and I, the BIS has always thought, that both of those things uh, should lean against the wind uh, of the credit excesses. Um, interestingly enough, at the moment, there seems to be a general sentiment that um, macro prudential should be used in that fashion, but that uh, it's not so clear monetary policy should. And the reason why is the central bankers, again, sort of recognizing that this complicates their life beyond simple price stability. So there's a kind of natural resistance to doing this. But anyway, the, the, the BIS and, and, and me included, in the good times, we should use both macroprudential and monetary policy to lean against credit excesses. Uh, and that the failure of both, uh, and there were big failures on both sides, contributed materially to what happened in 2008. Um, I'm, I put all my emphasis today in monetary policy, but I could, I've got another whole series of lectures where I can put the finger at the regulators as well. Um, okay, so that's in the sort of the upswing. Okay, we need to lean against the wind on both fronts. Because if you don't, and we have a bust, it's enormously costly. That's the central point. It's worth doing a little, little bit of costly stuff on the way up to avoid really costly stuff on the way down. However, what's happening right at the moment is that people are talking increasingly about the use of macroprudential policies for purposes that are entirely different from those for which they were originally devised. You know, so it's like you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you some medicine and uh, good medicine for the illness that you've got and then you develop some other, you develop some other illness and the doctor says, well, absent anything else, keep on taking the previous medicine. No, it, it, so we have a situation here now where we did all the thinking about macroprudential tools in the context of joint use with tighter monetary policy in the boom. Now what people are talking about is we want to keep interest rates lower for longer, and we're going to use macroprudential policies to offset the side effects. That's basically what people are talking about. There is no analytical basis, uh, no theoretical literature. There is nothing to support this combination of the use of these policies. They've picked it out of the air because they want to continue doing what they're doing because if they stop doing what they're doing, they will admit to the fact that they might not have been right to do it in the first place. So we have some deep sort of issues here. Um, on the question of whether all debt is bad, uh, I mean, obviously not. Um, the, the, the concern, I mean, I think about my own country, Canada or Australia, you know, we've built up foreign debts in the course of centuries. But the money has, generally speaking, been well used to build ports and railways and, and stuff that generates returns whereby you can not only pay the people that lent you the money, but you can get richer yourself. Okay? So debt in itself is not a bad thing. And financial deepening is not a bad thing. But as with, I can't remember, I think you used, a, somebody used the sort of the quarters of stability, which is a phrase that Axel Leonufut often uses. Quarter of stability that, you know, when a certain range, everything's okay. But once you get beyond that range, it just goes bang, you know? You can blow a balloon up only so far. 
Um, and I think with the debt, that's what we've got here, is that a lot of the debt has been taken on and has been used for non-productive purposes. And housing is right at the heart of it. And uh, there's a paper by uh, Orda, Schulerich and Taylor, I think it's a uh, Hong Kong Monetary Institute research paper, where again they use this very long database. Uh, and their contention is that if you're, if you're looking for a single source of problems, um, the, how, the property sector is the place to look. The property, non-productive development is, is at the heart of virtually all of these things. So, um, Debt is okay, up to certain limits, but you want to be looking very carefully at the purpose for which it's being used. And, um, I mean, Argentina, I mean, you would probably admit is a case where, uh, you know, a lot of the money was used and was misused, malinvestments, and the upshot is people can't pay, and then we have a problem. So that was the first question. The question on Brazil, um, I don't think I'm going to get them all here, but the, 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 the business about, um, you know, the room for maneuver in, in Brazil, obviously extremely limited. Uh, Brazil has a big uh, debt. I mean, they pull back on the external side, but it's got a big internal debt. Um, the, the, the pension system is totally out of control. Um, and I mentioned earlier on, talking about uh, Sergeant Wallace, Remember I was talking about Sergeant Wallace Bernholtz? What I meant to say, I didn't get a chance to get into it, but I can do it now, is there's a very famous paper written in the early 1980s, I think, by Sergeant Wallace, which is called Some Unpleasant Monitors to Arithmetic. And this was written at the time when, when monetarism was at the height, and everybody said, oh, that's the answer. We've discovered it. And Sergeant Wallace wrote this piece, Some Unpleasant Monitors to Arithmetic, to prove that just keeping the money supply under control or commitment on the part of the central bank was not sufficient to avoid problems. That if you had a big fiscal problem, okay, what would happen? A big deficit, a big debt. Point is the government has to borrow because it's got a big deficit. It can't cut all the pensions overnight. Government has to borrow, but it's got a big stock of debt, so people won't lend them the money. So then you have to go into the central bank Central bank starts raising interest rates. They can see the inflationary pressure. But the more they raise interest rates, the more they raise the debt service on the debt, which is big. And the more they do that, the more people worry about the need to go back into the central bank. And then people start fleeing the currency, and all of a sudden you have a huge problem, hyperinflation. And these things have their origins in Latin America. If you go back and you look at the history, these problems are not monetary problems, they're fiscal problems. And Brazil has got a big fiscal problem. And uh, Venezuela is clearly at the top of the list, but Brazil has got a big fiscal problem. And uh, somehow they're gonna have to try to deal with it. And as I said earlier on, the fact that the political situation is so fluid is not helpful, eh? not helpful. So, um, the, 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 the thing about the dollar, I mentioned that. Um, a lot of countries, emerging market countries, have got liabilities in dollars. And um, if the dollar goes up, and you know, you know, the tax cuts in the US, and they're already at full employment, and interest rates go up, and the value of these other currencies go down, then the capacity of these corporations to service those debts in dollars is obviously going to be limited. And I said before, and faced with a shortage of dollars, the question is, what's the Fed going to do? What's Congress going to do? The answer is, we don't know. Um, the mandate in Brazil is inflation only. Uh, frankly, given Brazil's history, I can understand that. Uh, it was very important in the middle 1980s, I guess, and later to um, confront the inflation problem. I think Brazil did that very, very well. But as you talk about sort of the single mandate, and surely it's more complicated than that, I would absolutely agree with you. Uh, I worry in a way, where demand side influences are driving inflation, there's no conflict, right? You don't need a dual mandate like with the Fed. 
because if you're above full employment, you'll get inflation. If you're below full employment, you get deflation or disinflation. And so in both instances, the signal from monetary policy is the same. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at the unemployment level or whether you're looking at CPI. You get the same signal from monetary policy. Uh, but there are circumstances in which that's not the case. And clearly, supply-side movements uh, are very important. And also, all of these sort of asset price financial imbalances that I referred to before, I think the central bank should back off the single near-term price stability. No, the governments should back off giving a near-term price stability mandate to central banks. Okay? It's more complicated than that. There are these other things that are threats to the future functioning of the system. Um, does the, do the technocrats at the Central Bank of Brazil benefit from higher rates? This is a debate I'm not uh, familiar with. Uh, the only thing that I do know is that uh, the way in which the government has intervened, what is it, B, say the, uh, BMEDS? The, the government, um, um, what's the word, uh, subvention subsidies for uh, corporate borrowing in Brazil. Bedmes. Yeah, Bedmes? Bedmes. Yeah. Bedmes. Yeah, they're starting to back off now, but uh, you've had 20 years of misallocation because of that. And uh, I think that's been a, it, it has been a big mess, and I think it's something that's going to have to be sorted out. So, um, but as for the Bank of Brazil, I don't know. We can come back to that in a minute. Um, the third question about um, it's not globalization that's driving wages and prices. Uh, it's, uh, if, I, if I got you right, it's, it's, it's bargaining power. Uh, well, I guess my immediate, my immediate reaction is sort of like this is like the NRA saying it's, you know, it's not guns that kill people, it's uh, people that kill people. And the response is, but, but the guns help. Um, so my starting point is that when you've got a billion extra people thrown into the labor market, and their influence is not just because of, what's the word? It's not just because of the goods that they produce, which drive down prices elsewhere and wages. It's not just the threat of immigration, which drives down so not just immigration, which drives down wages. Offshoring. It's the threat of the offshoring, that the companies can make a very credible threat, as they did in Germany, OK? If you don't behave, Ertig and all this stuff, we're moving to Slovakia. And it's a totally credible threat. And that's basically what leads people to seed, if you want to put it that way, powers that they might otherwise have. But in the end, my view at the moment is that there is a huge problem here in terms of the balance of power uh, between the workers and the dispossessed and those left behind and the others that are actually doing very well out of all of this stuff. And this is something that we really need to address in a very systematic way. And um, I keep hoping in the States that the Democratic Party will sort of pick up on all of this stuff go back to their roots, you know, their blue-collar roots of, of being concerned about the average working person. But thus far, I've not seen much of it. But I, they're so diverted by the Trump stuff that uh, it's, maybe it's not surprising. But I do agree with you, this is a real issue. But I think when we think about globalization and what came out of that, it was just the simple billions of people thrown onto the labor market. First thing you think of is demand and supply in the labor market. You can resist it, okay? but fair enough. But the initial shock was a... I should also mention, too, in terms of this keeping prices down, because I didn't mention it before, that it was not just globalization. It was the demographics. Okay? It was the baby boomers coming through the, um, uh, through the industrial countries and pushing up the workforce and, uh, and basically reducing the capacity of labor to raise wages. And there's a very good piece on this done by uh, Charles Goodhart, who's an old friend of mine, uh, in association with some people at J.P. Morgan. And, um, and I think this is an important, it's an important article because I think when you read the papers, 
there's a lot of misinterpretation, it seems to me, about what's been going on. And the way that I think about it, and the way that Charles thinks about it, is if you go back 20 years, 30 years, whatever, say, what happened? And for those of you who are still familiar with sort of ISLM real output type of models, um, I think what happened was that the aggregate supply function sort of shifted right, okay, with globalization and the demographics shifted right. At the same time, aggregate demand shifted down, and it shifted down, one, because of forced savings in Asia, particularly in China, Okay, the whole system was set up to keep wages down. Um, in the advanced market economies, because wages were under pressure, consumers didn't have the income to keep up consumption. The bosses, the corporations, were all making lots of money because in the first instance, the wages were under pressure. They didn't feel the necessity to invest in order to keep ahead of the competitors. Then we had all of these sort of boom-bust cycles in Germany with reunification, Japan in the early 1990s, where after the, the bust investment fell like a stone. So you had this situation, it's grosso modo, where supply is going up, demand is going down, and the central bankers in this ISLM kind of world, quite rightly, right? quite rightly said, we have to back in the demand. So they backed in the demand by lowering interest rates and easing money. And that was a perfectly sensible thing to do. The problem with that fundamentally Keynesian model, or Hicksian Keynesian model, is that Hayek is not there. Okay? But Hayek is there, lurking beneath the surface of the model. All those imbalances that I was talking about which are not in the model. So this is sort of what happened in the last 20 years. The central banker reaction was totally consistent with the model. But the problem was the model left out all the stuff that's now causing all the problems. And that's what we have to confront. So looking forward now, okay, going back to Goodhart and my own considerations, what happens now? Well. I guess what I see is that this supply thing, conceivably, okay, and there's a huge uncertainty out here, what's going to happen to productivity going forward? Let's suppose productivity is fairly weak going forward, in which case we've got weak supply, okay, but the demographics, sorry, um, let me go back one step. Um, yeah, so the productivity is weak. And we now have a reversal of all of this demographics that I was talking about, okay? The baby boom is over in the advanced market economies. The labor force is already declining in Japan and China, okay? The turn has already come, okay? So all of that supply side stuff is now gonna go into reverse. So the wages are gonna go up. They haven't yet, but I think they will. I'm telling a story now. So the wages start to go up. So now the workers have got more money to spend. Okay. Um, the investors are basically saying we don't have cheap labor, so we've got to invest more in capital. So now I, C is going up and I is going up. So now we've got the total reversal of what we had before. Supply is going down, demand is going up, and the interest rates are going to go up. And the interest rates might go up big time. But what happens with Hayek? <laughs> back again to all this stuff I was talking about before. You know, I was suggesting that the central banks are caught in a kind of debt trap, right? But it's not just the central banks that are the problem. That if this is the underlying economics of it, what's going on, the markets themselves, the longer rates, may start to move up. And we've had hints in just the last few days. The longer rates might start to move up all on their own, okay? And in fact, the funny thing about it is um, there is a disconnect right at the moment between the short end and the long end, okay? So far, it's been a disconnect where the Fed is raising the short rates and the long rates are just sitting there, right? But it's entirely possible, it seems to me, the disconnect will come 
Another disconnect will come with a sharp upward movement in the bond rates, okay, in spite of only moderate movements in the short rates. And then you see what the implications are in terms of debt service and corporate failures and all this kind of stuff. That's the kind of worry that we have sort of going forward. So that's why I think there's a tremendous, just the possibility. I'm not saying, you know, the other thing about complex adaptive systems is you can't forecast with any accuracy. But you can at least see the, the points of stress. Maybe things, you know, this is an issue. Good policy making involves thinking about the bad things that might happen and trying to be prepared for them. And so if you said to yourself, there's a possibility that maybe there's something unnatural about buns at sort of minus 10 basis points, now, maybe there's something unnatural about that, uh, then you should be preparing for the possibilities. And a lot of the preparation has got to be made on the legal side, you know, in terms of, I can't remember who I was uh, talking to you at the break. Many years ago, uh, a guy uh, at the American uh, Enterprise Institute, uh, Herb Stein, said, if something is unsustainable, it will stop. And Rudy Dornbush said, yes, but it will go on for a lot longer than you imagine, okay? And the real worry is that it's gone on a lot longer than we might have imagined, but it will stop. And the unnatural will have to do something different. It won't be the same normal that we had in the past for all sorts of reasons. I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, Muhammad Al-Aryan is always talking about the new normal. But there, there will be some how sort of renormalization. Then the question is, are you ready for it? And my worry is we're not. So you may raise all of these. For those of you who come back this afternoon, raise some of these questions for Jean-Claude. And uh, he's actually got a very open mind. And I think uh, the reason is he was an engineer that was sort of thrown into economics. He didn't have the benefits of a good economic education. So, um, he actually, he's made a lot of comments about, you know, the failures of models and how bereft they all felt at the ECB in 2008 and 2009. And I think he's quite uh, open to this idea of complexity as well. So, um, so you'll have a good discussion with him. There were two more hands uh, that I saw, um, and it would be nice to give them uh, the chance. Sure. So maybe we can try to uh, have quick question, quick answer, and then it would be... Done. So it's it's already. Hello, uh, I'm Afroz Alom, and I'm from Bangladesh, and I'm for option C, that is uh, development path. So my question is about non-performance uh, loan that M uh, NPL that you said, especially it in here it's increasing, and if you look at Greece and Cyprus, it's like more than 40 percent is there. Even this non-performing loan is not is increasing here. It's also increasing in developing countries also nowadays. So, and it seems like this uh, monetary policy or this banking system is really failed to tackle this kind of issue. So how is like your account so that it can be, not maybe solved, but at least to be in a stable situation, whether it should be the physical or like it can be the combination of both. Thank you. I'm at Regallo, option B again. I have a um, question on, the, on corporate de debt. Uh, you argue that corporate debt is, a, is, a is still a disaster and it's spreading to emerging uh, markets. I would like to ask you to expand a bit on which were the role of credit easing and quantitative easing in uh, advanced market economies to spread the disaster. And if, the, if you think that the next turmoil will will start in China and in the in the in the short run as someone argues then the second question is also linked to the concerns also Benedict and Julian Clara expressed on the uh, on employment regulation and I would like to start with Italy where the supply side approach of the OECD have, have been implemented over the last 20 years with the Legge Biagi uh, reform, all the market, li of, of all the reforms of the labor market, it's simply, uh, it is, it is the approach has proven to not 
not working. We, and then uh, we experience now falling wage shares, uh, high, precari high precarization of the of the labor market uh, need that are the one of the uh, in and the highest uh, one of the highest number in the Euro European Union and underemployment uh, so in this sense if we want to if our methodology uh, should be starting from the empirical evidence to the theory well for Italy I, I will say that the that the, the marriage between uh, that Keynes and Hayek are still incompatible Okay, um, the, the question of N NPLs, um, yeah, I, I think e easy money sort of both before the crisis and since the crisis um, has encouraged uh, loans that in the end have proved unserviceable. Um, and those uh, loans really ought to be ought to be dealt with, um, but in many instances they're not being. And uh, Ben Bernanke actually wrote a paper about this in the early 1980s, I think it was called Non-Monetary, no, Non-Financial Propagation in the Great Depression. And um, the, the problem is with these NPLs is that um, the, the the banker doesn't know whether, the, whether the, the company is really bankrupt or not. And he's sort of hoping that something will turn up. So you keep the loan in the books and you've got the upside. Okay? And as long as nothing happens on the downside, it, you just sit there. Okay? But you've got an upside. And the reason why they don't want to blow the whistle and admit to the non-performing loans is because they've accumulated to such a size that the bank doesn't know whether it can survive writing the loans off. And that's the sort of situation that you have to avoid. If you're, if you're in that kind of situation, then it seems to me that the, the next stage is the bank, you've got to write the NPLs off, and, in, and then you've got to decide what to do, whether to sort of close the bank down or recapitalize the bank. And in many instances, I think we should be prepared, as long as there's other banks to pick up the slack, we should be prepared to close the bank down, the lender down. Um, and I think increasingly we should be prepared to use government money to do it. So that in the, in the limit, you might have to recapitalize the banks using government money uh, to keep them going. And uh, my ex-colleague, Claudio Borio, uh, he very strongly is of the view, I haven't thought about it myself personally enough, that um, governments that have got room for fiscal maneuver, that the best use that they can make of it is to recapitalize the banking system and get the private sector. Okay, this is the most important thing he would contend. So the NPL is it's a big issue and it has to be dealt with. One of the things that's come out of the OECD work is that another reason why banks don't want to face up to non-performing loans is because um, the legal system for rendering corporations and households insolvent is just inadequate. And the big thing people worry about is that the banks, they know that, what's the phrase that I'm after, that, that if they repossess the assets, that, sorry, that if they, if they declare the known non-performing before they can repossess the assets. The legal structure is so cumbersome that by the time they get a hold of the assets that have been pledged, they're worth nothing. So they don't do it. Saying it's a, it's a, it's a problem with the legal system and the OECD work seems to indicate this is, this is a big, it's playing a big role in many countries, impeding the sort of proper functioning of the system. The judicial system is not keeping up. Italy is a very good example where it's terrible. I think it takes three or four years to actually resolve a, a, a banking loan problem and what you take away is very low relative to what other countries take, uh, take away. So um, the corporate, corporate debt issue, um, 
I think there's two things. One of them is, is just the actual levels of corporate debt. I mean, in the U.S., um, the corporate debt situation has, has, has worsened significantly since, since the crisis. And a lot of people now are, are sort of very worried about the overextension. Um, one of the big things that's been going on is that uh, companies have been buying in their shares, and issuing debt, and using the money to buy in the shares. And there's a guy called Andrew Smithers, who's uh, even older than I am, and uh, he's still, he's got a blog, he had his own firm, but he's got a blog now for the FT. And he makes the argument, which I think is very sort of uh, persuasive, uh, and also has to do with why there's been so little investment in recent years. Andrew contends it's a no-brainer that if the interest rates are very low and you can borrow the money, okay, you, 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 you borrow the money and you buy in your shares. If you buy in the shares, you raise the value of the shares. But the management compensation is linked to the share value. So from the manager, it's a no-brainer. You buy in the stuff, you raise the market value of your company, okay? You take your own personal profit. You cut back on investment to increase your cash flow, because the cash flow can be used for exactly the same purpose, pushing up the value of the shares. And this has been going on like really big time in recent years. Uh, in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, and increasingly now we're seeing it in Japan. So uh, there's some big issues out there. Again, complex adaptive world, the interaction between monetary policies and compensation practices that I can assure you nobody ever thought about before. But I think it's an important feature of what's going on here. Um, so, um, and in China, of course, I mean, I won't, you know, we're all familiar with the, the, the situation in China where there's been this massive expansion of corporate debt, uh, and in Southeast Asia more generally. And there's a guy that used to work at the OECD called um, Adrian Blundell Vignal, who's an enormously bright guy who's worked on both the private sector and the public sector sides. And uh, again, he's got one of these huge databases and his contention is that the people in Asia that have been doing the most borrowing are the corporations that are in the areas where the profits have been declining the most. And a lot of that's in the pro uh, allied with property. So, um, so there's some issues out there. Uh, I think uh, one of the questions was, in a certain sense, where is the, where's the crisis going to start? And uh, the answer to that question is, um, who knows? Uh, going back to the beginning of my presentation where I said I can see weak spots everywhere. Uh, e every weak spot is itself a potential source of instability. And uh, when the thing starts anywhere, could start anywhere, my worry in a complex adaptive system is that we're all so interlinked that whatever starts anywhere will have big implications everywhere. And the fund and the OECD have done a lot of simulations. Uh, albeit with models that I think are inadequate to the task, but they all show that um, <laughs> if another sort of financial crisis emerges of the character of the 2009 crisis, the implications will be, will be global. So uh, get ready for it. Um, the reform of the labor markets in Italy, it hasn't worked. Um, you're much closer to it than I am, but uh, the sense I took away from uh, Pier Carlo, uh, who was the, now the Minister of Finance in Italy and who was previously the Chief Economist at the OECD, was that in fact the reforms haven't actually taken place in Italy. That there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of legislation, but not much has happened uh, on the ground. Uh, I don't know. What I do know is that um, at one point in uh, the OECD publication called Going for Growth, Italy was in there as the country. Sorry, not Italy, excuse me. Greece was in there as the country, which had initiated more structural reforms than anybody. And then you sort of took that conclusion to the Greek desk at the OECD, and there was just total incredulity. 
And the reason why was that there's just a big gap between legal reform and reform on the ground. You know, that uh, I had this, I did the EDRC review of Tunisia yesterday. And I remember having this discussion with the uh, Tunisian uh, people, the Minister of the Economy and a bunch of others, and saying um, they have passed a lot of legislation, okay? But legislation is just words. You know, the question is, is it happening? And uh, implementation is just always the... So I don't know in Italy. I don't know in Italy. Uh, your suggestion that one should always rethink the theory on the basis of the facts, I totally agree with. Like if you, you were of the view, look at they really have made this effort, it hasn't worked. I guess my reaction would be, okay, just like monetary policy, you know. Have any of you ever seen the Seven Sumerai, that old Western movie? It's based on, uh, not the Seven Samurai, what is it? The Seven, come on, a movie from the 1960s. Yeah, the seven, anyway, it's seven American guys. The whole story is based on the seven samurai. It's a Japanese story originally. And it's about these people who are essentially outlaws who decide somehow they get together to do a good thing. And in this movie, it's a Mexican town. It's almost like today in a way that's being menaced by a gang of, of real outlaws, real vicious outlaws. And these seven American guys are there to help them. And in the end, of course, they all die. Okay, the same as the seven samurai all die. They get outgunned and they all die. But at one point, Steve McQueen is talking to another one of these, I can't remember who it was, another one of these great American actors. And the bullets are flying in all direction. And the one American says to the other guy, he says, how did we get into this? And the other guy says, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And that's the way life is, you know? It seemed like a good idea at the time, but the scientific approach is to say, you, you put it up against the facts, and if, is that, who said that? I can't remember. So, no, I, I, I was thinking of a line that was appropriate, but it was, it was completely different. It's this famous line of John Maynard Keynes who was accused, oh, maybe it's the same point. Keynes was accused by a journalist of changing his mind, you know, of being sort of always changing his mind. And he responded, he said, when the facts change, I change my conclusions. What do you do, sir? <laughs> brilliant, brilliant response. Eh? 